Uh, welcome, uh, welcome to this uh, first uh, webinar of Oroville Green uh, Practices, uh, which is an initiative of Oroville Consulting. Uh, we have very good panelists with us uh, today, and uh, we also have a large number of participants. The idea of this webinar is uh, twofold. What we would like to do today is one is give you a, a, a perspective of what Oroville is doing in the field of uh, sustainability. And, uh, you know, Orville has been a living lab. It's, it's done a lot of pilot projects. It's done a lot of work. So today we'll give you a perspective of what Orville is uh, doing in this uh, whole uh, area of sustainability. At the same time, we have some very eminent speakers who are going to talk about what they have done in the field of, uh, in, in the field of sustainability, how they have approached it, uh, and how, uh, you know, Oroville can join forces with such wonderful organizations like uh, the Indian Institute of Human Settlements, uh, Carrot, uh, uh, the, uh, the Carrot Trust, uh, uh, Oroville. Unfortunately, today, Mr. Uh, Arun Krishnamurti will not be able to join us uh, from the Environmentalist Foundation of India. Mr. Krishnamurti, I believe, is uh, tested positive, and so he has gone to the uh, hospital, so he's not going to be joining us. But we have, uh, you know, Mr. Mohan uh, Chukant, who is the former Chief Secretary of uh, uh, Tamil Nadu and uh, a mentor to Orville. We have Mr. Bal Baskar, also a former IAS officer, and who is uh, now part of Orville Consulting. We have uh, uh, Tuan van Megan, uh, who is uh, a co-founder of Orville Consulting, and at the same time, uh, he's uh, he's a senior uh, official in uh, various committees in uh, Orville. And he's taken. Uh, he's he's also very passionate about uh, sustainability. We also have Mr. Aromar Ravi from the Indian Institute of Settlements. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, we have Dr. Jayashri. Dr. Jayashri is again uh, founder director of uh, Care Trust. Again, a wonderful organization which has won many many awards. So what we will do to now is that we'll have two sessions. The first session will be. Uh, we uh, will have presentations by uh, Mr. Mohan Chukant uh, and uh, Mr. Tuan Van Megan. I'll uh, start by uh, introducing Mr. Chukant for you. Um, Mr. Chukant is the former Chief Secretary of the Tamil Nadu government. Uh, he assumed uh, of, uh, as Secretary of Oral Foundation in July 2016 for a term of two years. Uh, he has held various positions uh, in the Tamil Nadu government, uh, including the Environment and Forests. Uh, uh, higher Education Department, and also Chairman and Director of the Tamil Nadu Energy uh, Development Agency. Um, Mr. Chukant holds a postgraduate degree in zoology. Uh, he, is, uh, he has a publication uh, called Nature Rambles, uh, uh, which was launched by the former Chairman of the Governing Board of Oroville Foundation, Dr. M.S. Uh, Swaminathan. Uh, he is a well-known Scrabble player and has won many national and international uh, uh, tournaments. So. Uh, welcome, Mr. Chukant, and I'll invite you to now start your presentation. Thank you, Mr. Vijay. Um, I'd like to, at the very outset, thank the organizers for having given me an opportunity to uh, address this gathering. And I know that uh, Oroville Green Practices has started this series of webinars to explore in what way Oroville can contribute to India's sustainability. I have chosen to speak about taking a look at sustainability myths. Uh, and why is this topic important? I thought that uh, when we talk about sustainability, we talk about many things at the same time. We talk about the environment, we talk about green, being green, green practices and sustainability. And this conflation of many topics, uh, I think uh, creates a bit of uh, confusion. And I thought that we should revisit the term sustainability. Uh, when you look at some of these terms, they lack precision and uh, don't have the kind of conceptual heft or weight 
which the term sustainability has. And I think one of the first myths which uh, I wanted to dispel was about what is that nobody knows what sustainability is. I, I would actually disagree there. Uh, so sustainability in the modern sense entered uh, our thinking in 1987 with the publication of our common future, a UN World Commission for Environment and Development, which is known as the Brundtland Commission. And one of the things which it has done is define sustainability as development that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. Now, I find that this definition is a very worthwhile definition to keep always at the back of our mind when we are dealing with sustainability. Because as I said, uh, there are a number of terms which we bandy around at the same time, and this uh, leads to lack of precision in what we are trying to talk about. Uh, some people think that sustainable is a synonym for green. And here, I would like to say that when we are talking about green, we are really talking about preference for the natural over artificial. But that is not what sustainability really means. Uh, sustainability doesn't shy away from using technology and being artificial if need be. So if you look at electric cars, you take wind turbines or solar cells, these are all the antithesis of what is natural, but they allow people to go around with smaller inputs of non-renewables while limiting less noxious chemicals, etc. In fact, sustainable has even gone so far as to bring nuclear power into the ambit of sustainability because uh, they are highly efficient. They don't emit uh, any pollutant gases. As long as we can take care of nuclear waste, nuclear reactors even can be considered to be a sustainable uh, form of power generation. So this may uh, be a little, uh, what shall I say, it may fa uh, face some criticism from the green world and the environmentalists, but if you're looking at it from the sustainable point of view, it kind of makes sense. Similarly, people like to talk about sustainability as being recycling. Uh, we are all fond of recycling metals, plastics, paper, wood, etc. But you have to really look at whether that recycling process itself is a sustainable practice. And we have to look at it through the focus of what are the costs in terms of energy and what are the costs in terms of transportation. Unless this is brought into the equation, your recycling per se is not going to contribute as much as one would uh, think it would contribute. Uh, I know that some of these points uh, are kind of debatable, and I'm sure that in the question answer section, people are going to have questions to ask about this, but I thought that I will put it out here so that we can think about it. Another uh, uh, example which I could mention is, for example, glass. Now, there is a difference between reusing glass objects and recycling glass objects. When you're talking about reusing, it is extremely good for the environment because you are not uh, incurring the energy cost. But when you're talking about recycling, that is using broken glass or pellets, which is used in glass manufacture, you have to factor in the energy cost and then it may not look so attractive. So as I said before, when you're looking at the thing through the lens of sustainability, the greater clarity will emerge as to whether a practice should be followed or not. Another uh, myth which is uh, uh, surrounds sustainability is that it's way too expensive. Uh, this again is something which is uh, highly debatable. In the short term, yes, sustainable practices can be expensive, 
But when you look at it from the long-term perspective, sustainable practices are worth doing and are actually cheaper in the long run. And it is because of the upfront costs that we are not able to take up many sustainable practices. Uh, another myth which people talk about is uh, sustainable living is going to actually lower our standard of living. This again is uh, not true. Uh, it's fortunately not true because what this actually forces us to do is to uh, look at uh, constrained optimization. And in fact, India has uh, given a very popular word for this, uh, which is jugad. Uh, which literally means a uh, flexible approach to problem solving using limited resources in an innovative manner. Now, this is something which uh, we should see more and more of, and uh, we should really look upon uh, sustainability as a means of raising our standard of living. In fact, uh, if you look at climate change, uh, you can look at it from another point of view that it is going to be a massive job creator. It's going to be a great boost to the economy. So you don't have to look at it only as a problem to be solved. It's a, also an opportunity. Uh, one other uh, point which I thought I would uh, just mention is uh, this again, a uh, bit controversial about consumer choices and grassroots activism being considered more important than government in interventions. This is something which uh, I feel that what the grassroots activism has to show is kind of lead the way, but ultimately governments have to take the larger decisions which are going to have greater impacts. So one of the uh, needs which we have to address is how do you get uh, the government, the state government, or people who are going to make these large-scale changes, how to sort of convert them into our uh, way of thinking. And this is something where I feel that Auroville has a great role to play, and we should actually uh, look at how to leverage the experimentation which we are doing so that we are able to make changes in the larger world. Um, Another myth which we have is that we need a new technology uh, to be sustainable. Uh, again, not necessary. And, uh, you know, sometimes old technology like uh, making that your tires are inflated to the right pressure is going to save you fuel. Uh, same way, uh, it, when Jimmy Carter wore uh, sweaters to uh, a, a sweater or a cardigan when he was giving a TV talk. Everybody found it a little laughable because they thought that it, he was just doing it because the energy crisis was there. But the basic point which was being made was that a, a, a low technology solution need not be uh, spurned just because it's low technology or that it has to be necessarily a new technology which we are able to use. Uh, another uh, point, which uh, this will be my final point, and I kind of uh, left it uh, deliberately uh, towards the end, because uh, I just wanted to mention that uh, once, you know, it's easy to think that once we have got this uh, sustainability mantra to look at things, everything would be easy to figure it out and that you know you can just go ahead and uh, undertake sustainable practices. Now, this is where the most uh, uh, difficult or uh, uh, problems arise because we need to really do a very complete life cycle analysis of what is the process and look at what are the energy inputs, what are the energy outputs, et cetera. When you don't do it, you get into situations where you are having doubt as to whether what we are advocating is really the right thing. For example, uh, converting corn into ethanol and using it was touted as a great energy solution and a great uh, environmental solution. But then 
we didn't kind of think it through. When you start growing corn for uh, and use corn for ethanol, you are depriving livestock and uh, food, which would cause people to think of using fallow land, which was otherwise lying fallow, to be brought back into agriculture. And an extreme example would be the way Brazil has gone about using rainforest to uh, uh, converting it into cultivable land and then increasing the corn production. Now, what now happens is your carbon dioxide level goes up, which in turn is going to have an impact on your climate change. And so the in net net terms, you may not derive a great benefit from getting ethanol out of corn. So I, I'm only uh, saying that you need to re-examine these things from the uh, basics all over again and not take it for granted. And so this constant re-evaluation, we definitely need to do uh, if we have to talk about sustainable practices in a uh, practical and in a way where you can uh, do it in a continual basis. I think I'll stop at this point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jokan, for uh, uh, the explaining some of the myths uh, related to sustainability. As you rightly mentioned, sustainability is more a process than a one-off uh, uh, thing or a one-off incident. And yeah, it's a fact that uh, sustainability also is very uh, regional. You know, the solutions are also very regional. It will vary vastly from one uh, one place to another. And uh, if we all have to do a little bit of uh, jugad wherever uh, we live and wherever we are to ensure sustainability. Uh, thank you very much. I would now like to ask uh, Mr. Uh, Tuan uh, von Megan. Uh, Tuan, uh, of course, is a person who I know now for almost uh, 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 30 years. Uh, Tuan has uh, been a good friend and uh, uh, we've always had many of these uh, discussions on uh, uh, sustainability. He's been the he's co-founder of Oroville Consulting along with uh, Mr. Martin uh, Skerfler. Uh, and uh, Oroville Consulting completed 10 years uh, this year. Uh, it's been doing very good work in the field of uh, solar energy and uh, you know, creating awareness on green uh, practices. Uh, uh, Tuan is also uh, very, very uh, involved in uh, Oroville. He's been uh, on a number of committees on Oroville, including the Energy Committee. He's been part of the committee for, for the construction of Matri Mandir, which is again a very beautiful uh, structure. Uh, Tuan, over to you. And we hope to hear from you what uh, uh, Oroville has done in this uh, field of uh, sustainability and what Oroville Consulting has done uh, in this. And it'd be very interesting to uh, hear you. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. In fact, uh, I was asked by the organizers of the webinar to give an overview of Auroville as a whole first, because there will be many people watching this webinar who are not much aware of what Auroville stands for. So I give you a quick presentation on, um, on Auroville. Um, the host has disabled participant screen sharing, so you have to dis enable it. Still, just one second. We are all in the hands of technicians nowadays. Pardon? Which is not very sustainable. Now it's coming, yeah. No? Yeah, and then I put it in straight. Okay, you know, I put it in straight. Yeah. So, um, first of all, let's put Auroville in the proper context of being a manifestation of the vision of Shiro Bindo, which is basically that 
he says mankind is in an evolutionary crisis. Mankind is a transitional, man is a transitional being. So this is the context in which our will and of course the Shiro Bandha Ashram have been set up. Uh, the mother also mentions that humanity is not the last rung of the terrestrial creation. Evolution continues and man will be surpassed. It is for each individual to know whether he wants to participate in the advent of this new species. And for those who are satisfied the world as it is, our will obviously has no reason to exist. So that is the broader context in which our will has been established. The our will charter, which was read out by the mother on 28 February 1968, and our was founded, is in front of you right now. It has uh, four very deep principles uh, that our will belongs to nobody in particular, that it will be a place of unending education, a bridge between the past and the future. It seems there was an internet failure in this building. Are you able to hear me now, Vijay, and other speakers and audience? Vijay, you have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, very clearly. Yeah. Okay, at which slide did it get disconnected? Can somebody tell me? No slides came up. This, no slides came up. Okay, then I just start quickly from the beginning. Yeah, yeah we can see your slides. Please Pardon go ahead. Me? Please go ahead, we can see the slides. Okay. So what I had said was that Auroville is, uh, had been established in the context of Shiro Window's vision of man being a transitional being. The mother had said the same thing in these words as well, that evolution continues and does not stop with mankind. And then on 28 February 1968, the Auroville Charter was read out by the mother during the inauguration of Auroville at the amphitheater near the Matrimondia. Of course, at that time, there was no Matrimondia yet. And the Auroville Charter talks about Auroville belonging to no one in particular, being a place of unending education, a bridge between the past and the future, and a site of material and spiritual researches for a living embodiment of an actual human unity. It's also important that in the first line of the charter, it not only says that Auroville belongs to nobody in particular, but that to live in Auroville, one must be the willing servitor of the divine consciousness. So coming to Auroville is a very conscious choice of dedicating oneself to a particular life. This is a picture of the inauguration, 28 February 68, another picture, and when Auroville was started in 68, the land looked like the top picture. Today, it looks like the middle picture. And of course, there is a city to be built as per the bottom picture. Auroville is located very close to Pondicherry, about uh, 17 kilometers north of Pondicherry. One of the first projects that was started is the Matrimandir, the mother called the Matrimandir, the soul of Auroville. The work on the Matumundi started in 1971. The Matumundi has meantime been completed, except for work which is still going on in the gardens. There are 12 gardens around the Matumundi, 
which are still under construction. In the bottom of this picture, you see the amphitheater where the inauguration took place. Of course, in 1968, there was no amphitheater, there was only the urn, but now it is an amphitheater. And this amphitheater is used, as you can see in this picture, for example, for collective meditations and some music performances. Now, I want to just highlight a few aspects of Auroville. One aspect of Auroville is unending, unending education. So there's a lot of learning going on. There is work going on. Uh, Auroville is a part of, is a place for karma yoga. So all of us who join Auroville are supposed to participate in some work or the other. And here you see a group of people working at that time on the Matamandia. Auroville also has a lot of cultural expressions because we have people from all over the world. A lot of different types of art, culture, and music are being expressed. It is also a community of serving. It is a community of caring. We do have uh, various medical facilities in Auroville. It is a place of research. And uh, this is a picture of the solar bowl, for example, in the solar kitchen where steam is generated for cooking. It's a place of sharing. Uh, a lot of collective services are there in Auroville, like this picture of a kitchen where people are sharing a meal. Architecture is a part also for the search in, for beauty. So here you see an experiment with ferro cement. And here you see another type of architecture and different materials. Here a building, which is a guest house in Auroville using Kerala tiles. Now the planned city area of Auroville comprises five square kilometers of city area and 15 square kilometers of green belt. And the city is comprised of four zones. One is the international zone, where there will be pavilions of various countries or continents. This is a maquette, a model of that zone. Already the Bharat Nivas Pavilion has been built. There is an auditorium called the Bharat Nivas Auditorium. There is a Tibet. Unmute. Yeah, as you might have noticed, we were again disconnected. There is a very heavy thunder and lightning storm here right now. And uh, lightning has hit just a few meters away from this building. And that's how internet got disconnected. So we go back to the sharing of the screen. So I was uh, speaking also have a building called Savitri Bhavan where uh, various lectures and get-togethers take place. And then we have the cultural zone. So the cultural zone of Auroville is education and culture. It comprises all sorts of school buildings, uh, educational facilities, uh, this is a nice picture. This is made, this picture is probably 30 years old. It shows uh, a, a computer class going on with computers which in those days worked on CPM, not even DOS, where, you know, if you press the WS or WordStar, you can go home for the coffee and come back before the WordStar menu would come up. So this is a computer class of those days. Uh, there is a lot of um, cultural uh, and art in Auroville, as you can see from here. This is a nice picture showing all parts of the world participating in the music exercise. Then there is the industrial zone, which is in the north of Auroville, where economic activities 
are supposed to take place. Um, there is already some activity there. This is a unit which makes water filters, special water filters, because they also have uh, electromagnetics in it and sound waves. And then there is, of course, the residential zone, which is comprising of four sec five sectors. And if you see on the picture from the right side to the left, the density increases. So sector one and two are low density, three and four are medium density, and four and five actually are high density. And these are some buildings of that residential zone using different type of technologies. One technology which has been developed in Auroville is the earth blocks. The earth blocks, they comprise of red soil with a very small percentage of cement. Initially, they use 15% cement. Nowadays, I'm told it is down to 5% cement. So with these earth blocks, you can construct buildings. And here you see a group of volunteers who have come for training. And this technology has been uh, shared with many neighboring countries in Africa, Africa and other parts of the world. And then, of course, there's the Green Belt, which in area is three times the size of the city, which started like this and is now like this. Energy has been part of the Auroville uh, experiments right from the beginning. We had uh, to start with wind turbines, I mean, not wind turbines, windmills to pump water. You can see one in the background there. Solar energy was already introduced in the mid 70s. This is the solar bowl, which uh, you know generates steam for the um, solar kitchen. And this is the first major solar plant which was built about 18 years ago. Uh, at that time, 36 kilowatt, which this plant is, was very big. Of course, now 36 kilowatt today is nothing anymore. Uh, street lighting, about street lighting, we can write a book or two, because we had tried everything You know, earlier. The batteries were on the bottom of the pole, and they got stolen. And then the batteries were shifted to the top of the pole, and the panels, and they got stolen as well. Uh, as we say in the light of rain, it was not daylight robbery, but street light robbery. But now what we are doing is we are basically trying to avoid this by having clusters. So we have clusters of street lights where the electronics, the uh, batteries and the solar panels are in a building nearby, which is much better than having them on the street light. Now water is a very serious issue. Uh, we have a lot of penetration of salt water in the ground in our view because we are very close to the coast. So there is a uh, constant effort going on to do more rainwater harvesting. And what Auroville has been doing right from the beginning is to avoid or try to avoid the uh, flow of the water from Auroville to the sea. Auroville is at, is at a height. The Matamundi is at the highest point. So that means that from there, the water would flow in all directions, including the ocean. And with bundling, and planting of trees, this has been more or less stopped now, the erosion. This is a place where water, rainwater harvest, rainwater is being held to avoid um, erosion and to avoid that the water flows to the ocean. Wastewater recycling in various forms. Mobility, we have made a very serious effort in the last two, three years to switch over to more electric mobility. There is a unit in our field called Kinesi, which is um, providing e-cycles, and hundreds of e-cycles are already on the road now. Organic farming has been a very big struggle uh, from the very beginning, but now there are a number of our field farms which are 100% organic, some are partially organic, but the move to 100% organic farming is taken very seriously. And there again, there are sometimes interns coming for training. Auroville and the region, Auroville is active in the region in various forms. We have a village action group that works with village uh, groups for development. There are projects like this, where volunteers of Auroville work with uh, volunteers from the village cultural exchanges and education. And finally, sharing the Auroville experience. We do a lot of uh, you know, seminars, workshops, active participation by volunteers in various activities of Auroville throughout the year. 
in all parts of our group, in all uh, activities of our group. So what is our group? Our group is a city with a soul. It wants to realize, it tries to realize human unity. It is unity in diversity. And the mother said about our will, you say that our will is a dream. Yes, it is a dream of the Lord. And generally these dreams turn out to be true, much more true than the human so-called realities. Message was given in May, 1966. So I hope that with this quick overview, you get some idea, those of you who are not familiar with Argoville, what Argoville is all about. And as you can see, Argoville has been from the beginning, uh, been engaging with sustainable development, but sustainable development also is part of a much broader vision. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tuan, for a very interesting uh, presentation on Auroville. You know, one of the uh, constant uh, responses that I get when I tell people that, uh, you know, I'm also I'm a consultant with Auroville Consulting. Oh, Pondicherry. You know, everybody thinks Auroville is Pondicherry. And I have to explain to them that uh, it's not. But, you know, thanks. It was a, a very uh, uh, good uh, presentation and very informative. We'll now uh, go on to the panel discussion. We have, as I said at the beginning, unfortunately, Mr. Uh, Arun Krishnamurti of the Environmentalist Foundation of India uh, could not make it today because he tested uh, COVID-19 positive. Uh, I have heard him many times and he's a great uh, speaker, a very passionate speaker. But yeah, but we will go on with the webinar. Now we have uh, uh, four speakers even otherwise. We have uh, we have Mr. Balabaskar, uh, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jay Shri Venkateshan, uh, we have Mr. Aroma Ravi and uh, we have Tuan. So we have four excellent speakers. And uh, what I will do is, is, is in this session, I, I will ask each one of you questions about what you are doing in, in your own uh, field and uh, how you are uh, carrying out uh, the work related to uh, sustainability. So I would like to start with Mr. Balabaskar. Uh, you know, because uh, Mr. Balabaskar, you've been in a very unique position. Uh, you've been secretary at Oroville uh, twice as, a, as an IS officer on behalf of the government of India. And, uh, you know, after retirement, you, you taught for a couple of years at uh, Bharati Rasan University, and then you joined uh, Oroville uh, Consulting. Uh, you, you, so you're in a very unique position to give us a very a good perspective about, you know, from the government point, government's point of view, how, how did you see Oroville? when you were its secretary. And now that you're working at Oroville Consulting, how do you see this, especially in terms of sustainability, in the context of sustainability? Well, as Mr. Mohan Jumkat said, we all understand sustainability in different ways. I can only tell you some personal experiences which uh, you know I, I recall. One of the participants had said, whether Adivasis, tribals, Bishnoi's, I mean, who live close to nature, have the highest sustainable standards of life. You know, that strikes a chord because, uh, you know, I served most of my life in, uh, in Haryana. And uh, in Haryana, as in most of India, which I did not know, I was basically an urban kid. Uh, in the villages, you know, you don't have private property. In the, the village residences, in the north, it's called the Lal Dora. And in the south, there is some name you know, for that. You know, you don't survey the area of the village and uh, you don't have uh, patas for the houses inside the village. And people have lived in the same area for thousands of years. And if that is not sustainability, I don't know what it is. And, you know, when government came with uh, housing schemes for people, I mean, I found it very strange that, uh, I mean, you are building houses which were not really sustainable for their way of living. You know, in, in fact, uh, as an aside, there was a gentleman called Devan Bridgekumar, who was a block development officer in Haryana. He built a, a new community development housing in the 1960. And uh, Queen Elizabeth came to India and Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru wanted to show her community development and he was taken to this this uh, housing project. And uh, it was so impressive 
that Devan Bridgekumar got appointed as our ambassador in Seychelles or something. From BDO, he became an ambassador. So when I went and joined in Gurugaon, I mean, uh, I think uh, after about uh, 22 years or something, I wanted to see this village. I wanted to see this housing project. I went there, it was total shambles. It was, uh, I mean, it was than a slum. So I could not understand. I asked a wise old villager who told me that this is not suitable for us because we live and we, I mean, somebody has a child and the son gets married, uh, the, the daughter-in-law comes, they have children, we have buffaloes which have, we have to tie and all that. You have a modular house, it does not suit them. The traditional Haryana house is flexible. It, it, it can accommodate a lot of people. Men live in one portion, women live in another portion. You know, they are, they are able to live like that. People come in, children are added. They are all able to manage in that place. So this housing project of Indra Awaz Yojana, whatever name you call it, all these are urban concepts, is not sustainable. So therefore, sustainability, we cannot teach the Indian villager. I think they have been sustaining themselves. He has mentioned the Bishnois. I have lived with the Bishnois. I mean, they are more caring about the environment than most people in the in anywhere you can see. But our mindset is somewhere it's imported this concept of sustainability, carbon footprint, so many technical words, and we think that what we impose should be done. It's not that way. So when I came to Auroville first, I was a little skeptical about this whole business of, you know, I mean, we have a, a, a small city area which will accommodate 50,000 people and they'll be able to live there and all. And I thought it was only reinventing the old concept of uh, how the Indian village lived through ages, you know. So I, I think we need to be very careful about what is sustainable practice. You know, we cannot impose something that this, because this saves a few watts of electricity, though, therefore it is sustainable. It is much more than that. In that context, from, I mean, a thought came to me when Mr. Mohan Chukat was speaking that technology always is about specialization, about smaller and smaller things, which is fragmenting, you know. And I remember, I think it was uh, Will Durant who said, technology heals, you know, in retail. Individual technological progress gives you new cures and things like that. But then it also kills wholesale with a nuclear bomb. What happens is that there is no integration, no synthesis. There is no, I mean, to use a very old-fashioned word, wisdom. I think what little I understand about what mother thought Auroville will do is that synthesis which might happen about technology being used in a way where it does not compromise the future. So I, I, I think Auroville also has to go a long way in that direction. But we cannot dismiss whatever people have been doing in the past as unsustainable and we cannot always think that new technology, new this thing will always give the solution. Renewable energy alone will not give the solution. I mean, I, I feel that uh, in uh, whole of India was using this gobar or cow dung as a fuel and I think that was sustainable also. But then we brought in renewable energy practice of, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, I mean, what are biogas plants. And I have seen it at close quarters. The biogas plants actually, in my opinion, was a disaster because it was only the landed fellow with a tube well or something, you could put a biogas plant. And then he will send people to collect all the gobar, all the cow dung from everywhere. And the poor people who are making what is called upla, and they were uh, burning it for cooking every day. I mean, th that was lost. And then they started going and cutting off wood. And uh, I mean, the loss of this, they were burning the wood. 
which, which is not really that sustainable as the cowdung was. I, I suppose these are the kind of complex issues which are there. So, I mean, I have nothing more to add. If there are any questions, I can answer. Thank you. Okay, but uh, Mr. Balvaskar also, could you tell us something about uh, uh, your role in uh, Oroville Consulting? How, how you are helping? Uh, well, uh, in Oroville Consulting, I'm an honorary consultant. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not really <laughs> there. When uh, they need I come, I uh, join there. Okay, Thank because you. you know, what you said about uh, sustainability is very true. And uh, I'll uh, you know, give there's a beautiful quote from uh, David Attenborough's book, uh, The Living Planet, which is 1984. And he said, there are three basic principles that should guide us. He says, first, we must not exploit natural stocks of animals and plants so intensively that they are unable to renew themselves and ultimately disappear. And second, we must not so grossly change the face of the earth that we interfere with the basic processes that sustain life, the oxygen of the atmosphere, the fertility of the seas, and the earth's green cover. You know, in fact, many people uh, forget the seas when they talk about sustainability. And thirdly, that we must do our utmost to maintain the diversity of the earth's animals and plants. As far as we can tell, our planet is the only place in all the black immensities of the universe where life exists. We are alone in space and the continued existing of life now rests on us. So, you know, this is, I thought this was a very beautiful quotation and this is exactly what brings me to uh, uh, Dr. Jayashree Venkateshan. Dr. Jayashree is a Smithsonian fellow and researcher and managing trustee of uh, Care Earth Trust. She obtained a PhD in biodiversity and biotechnology from the University of Madras. She is best known for her research work on biodiversity and studies in wetland ecology. Dr. Venkateshan works on issues of conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and ecological restoration with a special interest in wetlands. She has to her credit 30 scientific publications and uh, one book. Uh, Jayashi, I've heard you a number of, uh, I've met you a number of times, you've uh, uh, exchanged ideas, we have also, uh, done some things uh, together. Uh, what I would like to uh, ask you is that look, your organization which you founded, Care Earth Trust, is an award-winning uh, organization and has been working on issues uh, related to environment, policy research, education, biodiversity and wetland restorations, so to name some of the few. And in all your uh, presentations, wherever you talk, you talked about three Ps, passion, patience and perseverance which have taken you through many projects and helped you guide uh, yourself and, uh, you know, to be able to achieve the, uh, bringing in the, uh, in these uh, projects. Do you see sustainability becoming a priority for governments? And is there a sense of urgency to develop policies in view of the effects of climate change? And especially with regard to biodiversity, because that's been an area of your specialization. Could you tell us something about that? Yeah, I will attempt to answer your question because a bit too difficult for me to answer such a beautifully worded question. <laughs> With all the limited understanding that I have of the subject, let me get an answer. One of the things that I've realized working uh, uh, on this field for many years now is that uh, patience is the key. Patience and perseverance is the key because priorities are at various scales, priorities are at various thresholds for different people. You need to have the tenacity, the patience and the tenacity be at this and that I think is the one that's grossly missing when it comes to the sector that I represent in this panel, the NGO sector. And this is probably one of the reasons why we have not been very effective in pursuing sustainability as an agenda in the NGO sector. To answer your question specifically on sustainability, biodiversity, one of the privileges that India has uh, is that it has been a signatory to most of the conventions. In fact, all of the conventions that deal with natural resources. In fact, we are one of the early signatories to many of these conventions. And a lot of work has been done in terms of developing policy papers and developing technical papers, reports and stuff like that. But cutting across all this, uh, all, all the conventions, all, all the follow-up action is, are a couple of things that I thought I should highlight. The first, unfortunately, even after 20 or 28 odd years of signing the Convention on Biological Diversity, we still erect this argument that it's environment versus development. 
it's very painful to hear that repeatedly and even the most recent amendment to the eia talks about i mean the justification given for that is it's you have to pursue development and environment is a kind of a corollary that needs to be a bit a bit compromised upon so as long as this argument persists where you are showcasing environment as an opposing factor to development pursuing sustainability in real terms in action is going to be highly difficult in fact virtually impossible the second issue that i find a bit problematic in addressing the issue of sustainability pertaining to biological diversity i will not talk about other domains is that we seem to approach the issue with this belief with this very strong belief that we understand everything about natural resources and for every small problem or a big problem there is a solution whether it be technological or human that is irrelevant but we think we understand nature and there is a solution for it you also believe a kind of a one stop one step attempt to correction will sort out the problem and this is more so in terms of the number of projects that are taken up for afforestation for reforestation for restoration of wetlands and all that but what the the reality tells us and what the most recent un report has said very categorically is that we have not even been able to manage to address even a single target i mean we nowhere close to achieving the target so i would say while in principle there is a lot of focus a lot of importance being given to sustainability in terms of operation we still very very nascent and there's a long way to go compounding all this is something that i realized a couple of weeks ago couple of months ago actually much to the dismay in a state like tamil nadu which is something that i mean a state that everybody looks up to in terms of scientific capability when we had to actually embark on an exercise of developing people's biodiversity register which is a kind of a mandatory statutory requirement under the biodiversity act we found that many expertise domains are null and void for instance insects aquatic insects there's just one expert in tamil nadu insects there are hardly five the basic expertise that's required to understand the fundamentals of biological science of biodiversity is missing or it's been lost so we are at a situation where we really need to focus on building the basics and only then we can talk about operationalizing all the commitments that we have made to the international conventions i hope i answered your question Vijay, you are muted. I think. Yeah, clear. sorry. Okay, I mean, I'll repeat that. Uh, uh, you know, one of the biggest sufferers of climate change has been um, by biodiversity, and uh, uh, you know we have biodiversity hotspots in this country, like the Western Ghats, for example, the entire Northeast, for example, and we still don't even know how many uh, species are there, or we are still discovering new species in these areas. Is there a structured effort by governments today? to you know do something about this biodiversity about you know uh, getting uh, data with the, on this biodiversity and uh, you know storing that data analyzing that data and uh, then seeing uh, how, how do we go further on this what is your experience are you asking me this question yeah i'm asking you whether you know what is your experience in working with governments on biodiversity do you do you see your governments really focusing on biodiversity or creating a structure to gather data systematically so that the, you know they can act on uh, the biodiversity uh, challenges okay i see four parts to your question and let me answer it that way my experience of working with the government both at the level of the state as well as the center has been very positive uh, now the reasons for it i have never bothered to analyze but it's been positive and there's been a lot of learning on both sides so let me say, say that up front as regards the kind of data availability that is there india is one of the data rich countries but much of this data is data that's been collected in the past we really don't have data that's been regularly updated and there have been enormous efforts in creating meta databases in fact uh, beginning with the people's biodiversity register experiment way back in the 80s data has been collected curated and stored in fact one of the best known open citizen science data portals that's currently on is being done by the french institute of pondicherry in collaboration with strand like genomics it's called the india biodiversity portal so that's not the issue the issue is going forward 20 years from now will we have the capability to collect data will we have the capability to authenticate data 
I mean, we are now at a point where you get these species records, and let's not get too excited about species records. I hope Dr. Chukat is on pan this panel and will correct me if I'm wrong. Most of these uh, new records are actually very dubious. You see something, and for the first time, and you believe it's a new record, and uh, <laughs> stuff goes on many a time. The validation process that's required to erect a species is quite cumbersome, but very essential. So that part of it is it's in a kind of a loop, you know. You have people describing new species. Now, coming to the question of why are more species getting described, it may just be that you have better facilities now, better technology at hand. You may have also refined technologies. For instance, earlier we were using a set of parameters, not with fauna, normally morphometric parameters to define a species. Now you have biotechnology. So the same, a couple of species are being fragmented into subspecies. So this is something that's going on. This is basic research. This research doesn't actually impact policy, nor does policy take anything from here. What we need for policy is to build an understanding that we are blessed with so many species, so many habitats, and that needs to be nurtured for the well-being of the human race itself. Because biodiversity is not about plants and animals alone. It's about plants, animals, animals, including humans. That is where we are stuck, and that's where I think we need to focus. As regards biodiversity hotspots, we have now three biodiversity hotspots, and that's something you should not be celebrating. Because that shows that these are areas of white endemism where the human influence of negative character is also very intense. We should be celebrating the fact that we are a mega diverse country, blessed with both marine as well as terrestrial diversity, and that needs to be nurtured for posterity. In fact, I would go a step further and say this is our responsibility, just as we would leave behind huge amounts of, or we attempt to leave behind huge amounts of wealth and you know, the kind of physical assets for our kids. It's our responsibility to leave. And a decent, that is what to me, in my own limited understanding is sustainable. Thank you. That was a very uh, detailed answer and a very I'll uh, now go on to Mr. Aroma Ravi. Uh, Mr. Mr. Ravi, uh, before that, I'd just like to make an interjection. Oh, sorry. Uh, this was uh, a point which uh, I thought I should make. See, a lot of basic uh, science research is very unglamorous. And one of the very unglamorous uh, sciences is the field of taxonomy. Nobody ever gets interested in taxonomy. And though there are a lot of species to be described, like was mentioned about not there being a single expert for uh, water insects or aquatic insects in the uh, Tamil Nadu. I think this could be said for any small group of insects, you would find that there just aren't enough people. And uh, everybody is into molecular biology and into genetics and everything else, but the basic field of taxonomy has very few takers. And this has been uh, not just a phenomenon in India, it is a phenomenon which is there globally. And unless we can bring citizens to, a, uh, you know, uh, people who are interested, lay people into the field of taxonomy, your next level of taxonomy of uh, beta taxonomy and other things will never get done. And this is something which ultimately is required. And uh, it is not just, uh, this is the area where, you know, the whole way of looking at basic research has to be changed. We are looking, uh, we, we give very scant uh, regard to uh, taxonomy, which is a handmaiden to a lot of other things which have to follow. If you have not identified your species properly, half your conclusions are wrong to begin with. I just thought that I would uh, put this point in because uh, not many people outside the scientific uh, field would even think about this as a problem area. Just thought I would flag it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go on to our uh, um, next panelist, Mr. Aroma Ravi. Uh, Mr. Ravi uh, is the founding director of the Indian Institute of Human Settlements. India's prospective interdisciplinary national university. Over a decade, for over a decade, he has built IHS into one of the world's leading education, research, training, advisory, and 
implementation support institutions, focusing on sustainable urbanization. He is an educator, global practice and thought leader with 35 years of interdisciplinary experience in sustainable development, public policy and governance, human settlements and global environment change. He is an alumnus of IIT Delhi and the Law and Management Schools of University of Delhi. His research and practice uh, lie at the interface of sustainability, climate science, and urban science. He has lectured at, uh, and taught at 90 leading universities across the world. Uh, uh, Mr. Ravi, uh, yours is again a very, very interesting uh, field because you're looking at urban sustainability. And IHS, uh, the, you're the organization of which you're a director, has carried out uh, you know, um, many uh, projects in the area of urban uh, sustainability, uh, considering that by 2050, according to uh, the United Nations, more than half the world of population is going to live in urban areas. Do you see a change in how urban planners will look at uh, sustainability in the urban context? Interesting question. Uh, I think from our current experience of COVID, uh, I, say, I would say the immediate response is no. It would be wonderful if we did, but we're currently not doing that. In fact, I think the interesting thing, and you know, I'll pick up from part of what Tuan and other uh, colleagues in the panel have talked about. The interesting thing about Oroville is it has the potential to show us um, how things could be different. I think the challenge with Oroville is that its own sustainability, or at least its own sustainable development within the context of a rapidly changing India is, uh, I would say, a little bit at the edge. Uh, so, you know, the question of urban sustainability uh, only becomes possible when you're able to actually keep the multiple balances that we are unable to deal with. And I think one of the most remarkable things, and that was shown in one slide that 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 one uh, laid out um, in his presentation, is that Orville has been able to bring back uh, and that's a really remarkable achievement. It's been able to bring back a forest uh, that has been gone from this, uh, this environment for a very long time. And it took a huge amount of effort, I would say, almost two generations of pioneers to make that happen. Because cities themselves are interesting things, uh, but on their own, they have no viability, they have no sustainability, at least uh, cities that, as we've known them in the last 5,000 odd, odd years because uh, all of uh, our life in urban areas depends on nature, on natural processes, on, uh, on biodiversity, of course, but also on ecosystem services. And unless you're able to balance the two together, uh, you're in deep trouble. In fact, uh, the current challenge that we are facing at the moment uh, with COVID is really uh, an expression of how uh, a planet which is now full of this very pesky, hopefully uh, transient species has actually sort of gone beyond its ecological boundaries and is reaching into spaces where it's very easy uh, for uh, another organism, in this case a, a virus, to jump from one species to the other. So in effect, we are drawing uh, into our environments, particularly our urban environments, um, a whole range of, in this case, it's zoonos, uh, of forms of life, or forms of other forms of consciousness which uh, are going to sort of teach us some very interesting lessons. So COVID, for example, is an urban disease. It comes from a peri-urban area in one particular part of the world. It's been distributed by sort of uh, very privileged people uh, using very advanced urban technologies like flying around. And now it is sort of infecting 6 million plus people in this country, most of whom uh, in some senses had no reason to, to, to get this. So I think, uh, you know, sustainability itself is an interesting concept. Uh, it's a concept that comes maybe from uh, sort of a, a reflection in the lower mind, so to speak. Um, it has a whole range of contradictions in it. I can say that having been part of this sort of debate and building up these ideas around sustainability and sustainable development for a very long time, including sort of having produced uh, some original work for the original development report and you know over the 80s and the 90s, and more recently having negotiated this thing. So, uh, in, in the larger development framework, we call it sustainable development. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it has many advantages. We have a framework that we're looking at. It's called the 
sustainable development goals that we spent three years negotiating in, in, in the UN. But I think the challenge is in the way that we uh, run and manage our lives. And it's not only cities that matter. It's a, it's a connection between uh, cities, towns, and villages, and the surrounding countryside. All of the things that you know Orville has tried to deal with, uh, maybe not so successfully at scale, but at least they've grappled with it, with those questions. How do you deal with questions of water? How do you deal with soil? Um, how do you deal with the growth uh, of, of, of plants and animals inside that? And then within that, how do you actually look at, at urban systems that uh, depend on that? Uh, those are the physical aspects of, of those processes. But the other thing that we often don't talk about is cities are wonderful. They've enabled the development uh, of, of societies over a very long period of time, but we still don't know how to manage them. And, and why do I say that? Because cities give you tremendous power. Uh, in some senses, they allow you to aggregate people, they allow you to aggregate economic activity. They also um, accelerate social change in some senses because most of the critical social revolutions that we've seen over the last uh, couple of hundred years have actually been, been, been sort of engendered and created in cities, whether it's uh, universal suffrage, it's you know whole forms of equality, et cetera. But the challenge is that cities also concentrate the dark side of the human spirit and, and practice. So they concentrate poverty, uh, they concentrate inequality, and we're seeing that, you know, we've seen that uh, on our television screens, and I experienced that in India over the last six months or so. Uh, they certainly concentrate risk. Uh, we've seen that in Pondicherry and Oroville, you know, when a cyclone comes coming or tsunami comes nearby, you know, so when you have a lot of people that are in one place, then it becomes very easy for them to become prey to a whole range of forces. And people naturally, in some senses, uh, congregate in places which are high risk because that's typically where the water is, where a lot of productive activity takes place. They also concentrate pa pandemics. Uh, and in some senses, most endemic diseases only survive because of the large urban population. So I think part of the challenge that we have is to try and balance out or find a dynamic engagement between the advantages of urbanization, the power that it brings, the productivity that it engenders, the livelihoods, and employment that it creates, the opportunity for learning that it creates, and the dark side. And I think, uh, in that sense, uh, a lot of the struggles of Oracle, because some of it, some of them have seen this, uh, or you know, over the last whatever 30, 40 years or so, are symbolic of of that struggle that we're facing in many parts of the world. And in fact, uh, I wish we had gone further, because in some senses, uh, the most of the challenges of the world are brought to places like Oracle to be able to to solve. So they're almost um, like a crucible where you're trying to, to address these questions, uh, you know, work them through in everyday life in very concrete material uh, and immaterial terms uh, to be able to then take them out and, and go to other places. Because if you're not able to address these questions um, uh, effectively as, as people, as societies, as communities, uh, it becomes very difficult to then take them out uh, and from these crucibles, from these uh, spaces of experimentation, uh, and then uh, reach out to the billions of people um, that, um, that that we that we that we have to deal with in, in let's say at least in India today and certainly across the world. When Orwell was created, um, you know, India had a, a population that was maybe a third of what it is just now. Uh, India has made tremendous progress in some senses, uh, but there are also other retrograde processes, and I think this bringing together. And maintaining the balances that you can see, you know, either in the twelve gardens uh, that that are there around Mathavinda, or otherwise, uh, in symbolic terms, is going to be um, very, very important and uh, and critical for us. So, I would certainly encourage those of us who are within Oracle to seek to do things more effectively, faster, and uh, you know, because sustainability is just a stepping stone. Uh, it is uh, not what Oracle is seeking for. It's just the threshold, because evolution is well, well beyond uh, the ideas of sustainability or sustainable development. And for the rest of us who have an opportunity of living outside, to be able to come back and renew and refresh ourselves and examine what these uh, experiences and struggles are uh, at multiple levels would be a good thing uh, to do. And you know, I personally found that a great source of inspiration and reflection uh, and uh, power in some senses. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I think this is a very interesting answer, but I'd like to 
continue on this one. Uh, two of the issues that you mentioned, one was that of uh, COVID, uh, the pandemic, and how it has affected the urban areas and uh, cyclones. Now, one of the things that you see is that, you know, in most uh, urban uh, areas, especially with India, you know, people talk about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the initial planning, uh, the, the, they, they talk about waste management, they talk about water management, they talk about mobility, but hardly anybody talks about resilience, you know, and these are resilience today is one of the, perhaps the most important thing for any city to get back, you know, from a, any kind of disaster, whether it's man-made or natural, uh, natural disasters or man-made. And why is resilience today still not such an important issue when it comes to planners and uh, uh, architects and our, our thinkers? Why is resilience being... Uh, well, I guess resilience has become a new fashion at the current point of time, especially in the planning space. But if you look at, at sort of India's older tradition, I mean, you know, I've walked in, in, in some of the sewers of some of the cities uh, that were part of the so-called Harappan civilization. I walked inside them, fine. And it's very interesting. So if you go to uh, part, of, uh, part of Kutch, uh, you go to Dholavira, for example. In Dholavira, you can walk in, in, a, in a contemporary Indian village that does not have sanitation, where people live in miserable conditions. And just 150 meters ago, 5,000 years ago, there was actually, uh, you know, there, there was not only sanitation and water harvesting, uh, but there were very large systems that you, you know, you start seeing a little bit notable to deal with a climate crisis, which actually took that civilization down. And, and many of those places survived with Bronze Age te technology for a thousand years. So many of these questions have been dealt with in the past. So resilience was very much part of our, our, our urban tradition, if you look at it. The challenge is in a world in which, you know, 100 years ago, you had about a billion people in the world. We're going to touch 10 billion people in another 30 years or so. Uh, there's a tremendous shift uh, in the Anthropocene. It's an exponential shift. And in some senses, COVID gives you a sense of how that actually change, changes in a very short period of time. But there may be at least 20 parameters across the world uh, which are, are changing that dramatically. So uh, the context of resilience now is, is, is at the planetary scale, uh, whether it's COVID at one end uh, or it's climate uh, at another end. You know, I mean, the reason that you're having cyclonic storms coming with the intensity uh, and, and frequency that you have is primarily because we're using uh, the atmosphere as a sewer uh, for all the wonderful things that we do and the lifestyle that we have. We don't have slaves, so we use energy uh, and the energy comes from fossil fuels. So it goes out of the atmosphere and you have a whole range of greenhouse gases which are going to elevate temperatures, that raises the sea surface temperatures, and no surprise. Uh, I mean, the physics on that is pretty, pretty, pretty well known. Uh, and then, of course, you have four times the population that may be living on the eastern coast of India. Uh, and again, no surprise that you have dramatic impacts. Uh, so, you know, these are feedback processes that, are, that exist. And we are now feeding back processes at planetary scale. Uh, and I think that is part of the evolution crisis that's happening at multiple levels that we're talking about. That's what I think, you know, Orville is, is seriously challenged, is seriously challenged by the sea, is seriously challenged by groundwater. Uh, it's kind of dealt with the questions of, 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 at least part of the questions of biodiversity. But all of these things are, you know, like many other places, concentrated in, in, in one location. So the imagination and the practice of building uh, in a fundamentally different way, which is driven by a fundamentally different set of values, uh, and it comes from a different place in some senses, just not only from the material plane where you're making sure that everybody has enough water and, you know, enough to eat and stuff like that, uh, is, is, is a core challenge. And much of that comes from the, from the values that we hold on to, what we value. Do we value, um, you know, let's say financial capital or money more than, than physical things? Do we value physical things more than people? Do we value people more than, uh, than, than the rest of life? when they're all connected with each other, right? So when you stratify, uh, you get power in some senses. It might be money, it might be physical power, but there are huge trade-offs that come back uh, as, we, as we know very well from Indian sort of mythology, uh, you know, whether you go to the Mahabharata or the Ramayana, or you go to any of the other greatest streams in, in Buddhism, et cetera, uh, they will come back uh, and they will teach you some lessons. Uh, so it's, that's, that's what's happening to us in some senses. So cities are, are built within, at least many modern cities, are built within the linear paradigm. 
You can do whatever you want. Nothing makes a difference in either space nor time. Uh, and that's not true. Both space and time curve back on each other. And the resources that flow inside it and the people that are in that. But especially with, uh, again, uh, in the urban context, there is this huge movement on circular economies. Mm -hmm. uh, does IHS, uh, what is your experience with uh, building circular economies and uh, how do you see that in the Indian context? Again, to take your own example, the, the circular economy was something that was normal in a village uh, in ancient India. It was, yes. it was normal. It was nothing extraordinary. Yes, yes. Yeah, so now everybody's talking about circular economy in the urban context. Yes. So the thing is to do it, do, I mean, to, to establish a whole range of circular processes uh, in physical terms may be a little, I'm not, not so difficult to do. The challenge is not that. The challenge is that when you privilege uh, profit over, uh, over life, let's say, uh, and you, you you privilege some one person's life and their wage and what they can do rather than somebody else, you're immediately setting up uh, a framework in which circularity is not possible. I think this is one of the fundamental challenges that Oracle faces in its idea of, of, of work and its, in its sort of connection with the external world. Uh, because Oracle's economy, in some senses, is deeply disconnected or you know it's, it's consciously so because the mother designed it as such. Um, so when you have interest rates that sit in between, uh, you can be sure that you cannot have a circular economy because, uh, you know, especially at, at moderately high interest rates that you see in the banking sector, many of us work in finance. I mean, I, I sort of do a fair amount of work in that space. Uh, natural systems, it's impossible for them to grow, even if you extracted very high rates, more than, you know, one, two, three percent. You know, most, most productive forms of agriculture in all of history never go faster than that. If you want a 14% return on something, or you know, if you're remarkably successful in a, in a startup or anything else that's there, and you're expecting to have in your whatever phase one, phase two kind of cycles, of, expect to get 30% return on the investment, it won't work. You can't have a circular system. It, it's just, you know, it's 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 it's, it's, it's incompatible. So there are deep structural reasons for that. Uh, so you know, these are these are connected kind of uh, processes. So. You can, you can try and recycle materials, and we do that a lot. You can try and recycle uh, and deal with you know, sustainable agriculture, deal with whatever it is. But if your, your entire system is pushing in a different direction, um, then you have some, some deep problems. So you can do that in the surface, and you can do that within a bubble, like you know, in Oroville, in let's say our campus in Bangalore, you can do that in a smaller place. But to do that for um, a, a mega city, uh, or a mega urban region with 50 million people, like the area between Delhi and, let's say, Amritsar or, let's say, Bangalore. Uh, that is kind of uh, breaking some of the, what we know of economics, uh, you know, physics, biology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are deeply in, in, incompatible in, in some ways. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was very interesting. Now we come to a, uh, 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 Tuan, uh, Tuan from Megan. Uh, Tuan, again, uh, you, you, you're a, a veteran at uh, Oroville, and uh, you co-founded uh, Oroville Consulting along with uh, Martin. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, you to give us a perspective of, you know, what was your vision in, uh, you know, 10 years ago when uh, you set up, uh, when you co-founded uh, uh, Oroville Consulting, what was your vision and how much of that vision has been uh, realized or uh, how much of it is there and what do you see uh, uh, in the in the future for this, uh, for Oroville Consulting? Yeah, thank you Vijay. First of all, uh, I want to apologize to the audience for that interruption which we had while I was presenting. There was actually a lightning stroke right here outside our window. Just as I was saying that Shio Bindu speaks of man as a transitional being, there was a lightning stroke. So somebody was reminding us of something. Before I answer the question, Vijay, I want to add something to what uh, Aroma was mentioning, that our will has to go beyond sustainability. You know, I, it's very interesting that, in a way, the Shio Bindu's vision is not at all to sustain. His vision is about transformation, about transition to a new consciousness, about transition to a different species even. 
So the sus sustaining uh, has to be followed by the question, what do you want to sustain? And what is it that you don't want to sustain? So in the audible context, that is a question that has to be asked also. Even if you manage to sustain without taking from future generations, you have to constantly ask yourself the question, what is it that in the context of our you want to sustain and what is it what you want to transform? So that is just an add-on to what Aro already was hinting at. Aro Consulting, by the way, was not just co-founded by Martin and myself. There were other people involved, including Raghu, who is now in, uh, in Singapore, and Chandresh. And we basically, we, we set up Aro Consulting because we felt that Auroville has a lot to share with the outside world and vice versa, Auroville can learn a lot from the outside world. So we wanted to create a platform where an exchange of knowledge, an exchange of experience can take place. Uh, the vision was that Auroville should interact more with the world around it and not be isolated from it. Auroville should share and learn from from the world around us. And I think to quite some extent, we have been able to do that. There is still a lot more to be done, but we got involved in, in programs of training. We did uh, policy writing for various states. In fact, the solar policies of Delhi, Orissa, Tamil Nadu, to, Tamil Nadu Pondicherry entire policy we wrote from here. We did work with regulators all over the country. You know, what happens very often with regulators and with policymakers is that the first draft that they prepare is usually two words and one comma. Yes, comma, but. And then comes a long list of ifs and buts. So what we try to do is to get rid of the but and say yes, and try to make those policies more effective. So that is one work which we have been doing. A lot of training programs. Right now, of course, because of COVID-19, they're all done on internet, but we have a beautiful training place here on the ground floor where we have received students, architects, policymakers, government officials, a whole broad range of people who come. And of course, the nice thing about Auroville is that you can then take them into the field and they can see things and they can work, they can do earth block buildings, they can install a solar system, they can work on an organic farm. So the, the, the Auroville environment lends itself very well for hands-on training. And you know, Auroville was also, uh, the mother had mentioned Auroville also to be a laboratory of evolution. So the laboratory, laboratory part of Auroville is already happening to some extent. I must also share that I agree with Aro that Auroville also, Auroville today is actually not sustainable. It is sustainable relatively in the sense that, yes, it is having all these projects, but with 3,000 people on 3,000 acres, it is quite comfortable to demonstrate uh, a sustainable life, but we have to be able to show models that can be scaled up and that can be implemented elsewhere in the country and elsewhere in the world. I believe that Auroville is quite good in, um, in incubating, in demonstrating, in trying out stuff. We have, of course, the, the good environment where people who live here are also quite willing to be part of an experiment. But we have to also demonstrate how this can be scaled up, how this can be made relevant for the rest of the world. So there is still some way to go. And if you ask me what all of you has to do better in terms of sustainability and, and all these practices is to make more effort to come out with solutions that can be applied elsewhere. We, of course, have people in Auroville who have done that. We have the Pichandi Kolam Forest Group who have done excellent work in Chennai. We have the Auroville Botanical Garden who have done work elsewhere. But that part is something where we can still do uh, a lot more. Yeah, I'd like to uh, uh, take you on this again. 
you see, uh, you mentioned that uh, on Orwell does a lot of training. Yes, there is a lot of training, but invariably they are to small groups. Would Orwell uh, be uh, interested or to look at in the, maybe in the next uh, 10 years to transform itself into a formal institution of learning for uh, sustainability you know, or uh, related to sustainable uh, practices and uh, processes? Is, is that one of your vision? Is that one of your goals? And are you really, because you've been doing so much of training and this training can be uh, you know, expanded to and be taken uh, to a lot of people because there are not that many institutions really working on uh, doing a formal training in sustainability. What is your uh, thinking on that? Yeah, actually, uh, Vijay, that is very much the plan. There is even a project for that uh, Auroville Green Campus where you know even students can stay uh, in, in, in temporary accommodation. Uh, that plan is very much there. I think it has to have two sides. It has to be an upscaling of the training in Auroville itself, as well as maybe going to places, because uh, it is not possible for everyone to come here. We could go to universities and, and you know, other places in, in India where we could do training on site. We work, for example, with Jeremy, uh, the Gujarat Energy Research and Management Institute, and we did training with them in their place as well. So that definitely is an area where we can uh, do more. Our foundation, by the way, is an autonomous body, but it is administratively linked with the Ministry of HRD, which has now been renamed as the Ministry of Education. So we are actually an educational institution in any case, uh, officially. So my answer to your question is yes, we should do that. Well, and again, uh, uh, Tuan, I think uh, some time back when uh, we had this uh, brainstorming session uh, before the COVID uh, started, so one of the ideas that uh, came up, which uh, we uh, uh, brought out, was uh, you know whether uh, Orville can also look at uh, being a, a hub for startups in the field of sustainability. So what do you think of that idea, and do you uh, think that uh, you know Orville can? Because Orville has tremendous experience in the field of sustainability. There are a lot of pilot projects. You are very good experts. You've done a lot of work. You are really committed to the field of sustainability. You, you could act as mentors to uh, startups in the field of sustainability. And you know uh, uh, what happens is, especially with startups in the field of sustainability, they don't have that kind of support uh, from the outside world because more and more people are more looking at the commercial part. But there are, uh, I, I know many uh, people who really are trying to do in their own small way, uh, innovate uh, on uh, issues related to sustainability. Would you look at uh, Oroville becoming uh, a hub a place where uh, startups can be mentored in the uh, related to sustainability. Of course, uh, maybe in a lighter vein, the whole of our world is one big startup. Um, although it is 50 years old, it is still in a very young phase of its development. The answer is yes. Uh, in fact, we have incubated, for example, if you, you have been probably you're aware of this smart irrigation, uh, we have done. That has resulted in a company now doing smart irrigation commercially. So we helped that to become, um, uh, we, we actually incubated that project in, in Auroville. There are a lot of people who come here for ideas. In fact, by coincidence, perhaps last week, we had a team from the, Auro, from the Pondicherry Engineering College. And the Pondicherry Engineering College has now a startup um, project, which is uh, under Niti Ayok. So Niti Ayok is, is doing this with them. And they came here to collaborate with us to help startups. They have a lot of people from Pondicherry, young people who are wanting to become entrepreneurs. And then they accommodate them, they give them space, and they said, can you guys support us when those entrepreneurs want to do something in areas that our will has experience in. So that is one field where we have told them, yes, we are open to that idea. So again, the answer is yes. Uh, we have to find more people to do all that work because we do have a, a, a relatively small team, but our will is in
Hello? Juan, we can't hear you. Juan? Yeah, there was a little interruption or not? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Another lightning strike. Yeah. Right. <laughs> the the maybe, lightning and thunder has come here also. Maybe a lightning strike in somebody else's place, but uh, we are done for, it for today, I think, with lightning strikes. Uh, okay, great. Uh, it was wonderful. I have, uh, you know, before uh, we get take uh, questions from the audience, I have a few more questions uh, to some of the panelists. Uh, Mr. Chukand and uh, Mr. Balanbhaskar, you are both renowned IAS officers. You worked uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, how would you uh, uh, say, do you, do you think uh, the government uh, would be interested if, uh, say, uh, uh, Orville Consulting set up a course on sustainability, you know, maybe a one week course, maybe a one month course uh, for the uh, for IAS officers when they're training at the, maybe the Lal Bahadur uh, Shastri Academy or the Administrative Staff College of India. Uh, do you think that these kind of uh, uh, you know institutions would be interested? Because for government, sustainability is, is not an option. Everybody in government, uh, you know, is talks about sustainability. They're very keen. They're keen to be sustainable. They're keen to implement a lot of uh, sustainability projects. But I don't see the kind of training that is happening. So do you think that government would be interested uh, to if or if or oral consulting sets up a training a program, uh, a curriculum on uh, sustainability and public policy? Mr. Chukar? Mr. Balvaskar? <laughs> no. You see, I mean, this is a thing which we cannot answer because in government would be interested. Government within quotation marks would always be interested in things like this. But then actually putting it on the ground, executing it, it uh, requires a lot more uh, things to be done, you know, because uh, going to the Lal Badu Shastri Academy of Administration, if we send them a proposal, Maybe the director will agree that you come and uh, conduct a course there. But then the logistics, the expenses, you know, those are things which have to be the nuts and bolts have to be sorted out, you know. I, I think we can start in a in a way. Auroville Consulting is already doing that with uh, Tamil Nadu government officials and uh, various things like that. So we can try that. Getting people from uh, all the IAS officers to Auroville and training them would be a nightmare. It will not be possible, but oh, we can yeah. send people there and give them a module. We can explore that. Government, yeah. government, in principle, is always interested in these things. How do we yeah. op operationalize it is is is, is the difficulty. Oh, yeah, true. It doesn't have to be in Auroville, but uh, you know, it could yeah. be at the academy. Yes, yes. Yeah, because uh, budding IAS officers, you know, for training, uh, something like that, and. Even in leadership programs for government officials. No, but I must also tell you that uh, you know, we, 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 you know, Auroville has done a lot of pioneering work, but Auroville is not the only place where sustainability is being talked about or <laughs> being sustainable. Yeah, there are people. You know, for example, I know my friend Anil Gupta, who is the IM Ahmedabad, uh, that uh, center for this thing. He runs the Honeybee Network and uh, things like that. He has been doing this. You know, he is. Of course, it's more on uh, innovation at the grassroots and sustainability he talks about. And uh, he, he, even he was not able to do this on a, let's say, sustainable basis. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because he got, uh, he roped in President uh, Abdul Kalam after his retirement. And he was doing these courses in uh, different places. And he, I think he did one course in uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri Academy. And then they did not call him for a repeat. That was the point. Mr. Chukant, do you have any views on this? I, I kind of uh, totally agree with uh, the views expressed by Mr. Barbas Kaji. Because this is, uh, I, as he said, in principle, nobody is going to disagree with the proposition. But to actualize it and to make it a reality is going to be a hard sell. And we better be very clear about it. What one can do is find training institutions which are already uh, sort of having these kind of things and if it is local so that the logistical uh, problems are uh, minimized to an extent 
one can offer that one would like to conduct a course and then hope for the best. But uh, to sort of have it just happen, I think it's not going to happen. Yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jayashi, one uh, last question for you. Uh, what are your views on uh, corporate sustainability responsibility? Do you think corporates will uh, join in a big way on the NGO to work with uh, NGOs like yours on sustainability? It would be very, uh, very wrong on my part to say that the corporates are not supporting the work on sustainability. But uh, there are still issues that need to be ironed out. For example, each of the corporates, in the absence of a larger framework, defines sustainability from its own perspective. And it's a kind of a predetermined template that you're forced to accept because, you know, NGOs are bereft of funds. So that's where the problem comes in. The second thing, as I said, the overall approach, you know, I, I keep repeating myself, please bear with me on that, that all this can happen within a time frame of one year, two years, or at max three years. Is something that needs to be revisited because as long as you put a time kind of a uh, determinant on that, it's not going to happen. And uh, the second issue is like when it comes to corporate support of uh, initiatives like this, my own uh, my own pain has been the fact that a large number of very good institutions who are actually doing this at the grassroots level get excluded. But once again, your selection parameters are so stringent that you need to have this amount of turnover, that you need to be in all these big league authorities and government bodies, only then the support comes in. So in the in such a scenario, people who really merit this kind of a support get excluded. And the third thing, something that I've been saying for some time now, nobody's heard it, of course, nobody's listened to it, of course, is that all the corporates need to come up with a singular framework as to what sustainability is and what sustainable development means for the country. You cannot just look at global targets and say, okay, by 2025, we will achieve it. That's been the biggest failing. These targets were impossible the day they were set out. And they continue to be impossible even now. We need to take a small step at a time, and that kind of gradation needs to be put into that framework. And we need to come up with a realistic benchmark to talk about sustainable development goals. That's where I find that corporates are very weak. And in fact, whatever they're doing should be should have achieved much more than what it currently does. That would be my response. Great, thanks. Um, uh, Mr. Ravi, again, uh, just a, 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 one last question. Uh, you know, the, for, uh, for, any, for any company, any commercial organization, urban area is the most important thing. Do you see uh, companies contributing uh, to uh, uh, sustainability in urban areas in a big way? Because Ultimately, the economics of, uh, of a company depend on uh, the area in which they are. And uh, do you do you really see the companies coming in and uh, you know uh, saying there will be partners in the, making the city more sustainable or the urban areas more sustainable? Yes, yes, absolutely. So I mean, uh, some of them, you know, I, I'll give you a concrete example. So about 20 years ago, there was an initiative in Bangalore that tried to do this, the Bangalore Action Task Force. Um, because they realized that the IT industry in this, in this city or the BT industry could not kind of survive, it couldn't actually thrive without actually trying to address the challenges of the city. Now, interesting things came of it, but uh, the, I guess the challenge is uh, many companies or many corporate organizations have very little idea of how to actually deal and, and manage government uh, and vice versa. So there has to be learning at both ends. So this is a new set of partnerships that at least in India is somewhat sort of at a very early stage. In other parts of the world, I can show you lots of different examples where the relationship between local government, let's say the mayor and the mayor's office, a whole range of, uh, of firms that come from that locality or otherwise, uh, communities and civil society organizations work together to enable these kind of processes. So it's not unknown. It's just that in India, uh, we are at a very early stage in this. And, uh, you know, CSR is a very interesting sort of framework, but uh, uh, like we just heard just now, the CSR committees are deeply stretched in trying to sort of meet the expectations of their own audit, their own sort of corporate governance frameworks and the expectations of, uh, of society. So 
Many of them are doing these kind of things. We are working with some of them. But in some ways, um, if you are stretched from the CSR side, it's much easier and probably more palatable for you to just put money into PM cares. And, you know, then how that actually works itself out of the city is anybody's guess. Great. Thank you. I think it's been a wonderful uh, 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 panel. I think the, the, the answers were very, very uh, interesting, very useful, uh, uh, very, uh, with a lot of insights. We'll take now, uh, since we have some time, we'll take questions uh, from uh, uh, some of the participants. Now, uh, one of the questions that uh, has been asked by one Mr. Uh, Matthew Terry, I think, he says, does the concept of sustainability change in different contexts? Would any of you like to take that as? I can probably take a shot at that. Of course it does. I mean, you know, there's a there's a question in the ch chat box just now about the hierarchy between the three pillars. The context is absolutely critical. The challenge, of course, is the way that, and, and I think Joshi mentioned this just now, is the sustainable development goals were designed as a universal framework. Now, that's a nice thing to have. It's like universal human rights and a whole range of things like that. It's important to have those kind of universal goals because we're dealing with a planetary civilization. But in a particular context, they have to be translated into you know, what the issue is. So the challenge of localization in some senses, and especially the challenge of building agency at the local area, where you can decide uh, that you know, for your context, let's say in Orville's context, that dealing with um, water is much more critical than, than dealing with uh, you know, something else that is to deal with, let's say, recycling solid waste uh, in a very physical term, or culture is less important than other places. So uh, absolutely, local context is important. The, the, the issue is, how do you uh, connect between what we call bottom-up processes, addressing situations in context, and what happens at higher levels of aggregation? Because they interact. The local context then you know, affects the region. Uh, the region then sort of aggregates at the state level. And if you have a, a conflict between what's happening at the state level on, let's say, the management of water resources and conservation requirements locally, or you're promoting uh, highly in, uh, water intensive agriculture because you need that for, for exports, for example, or aquaculture, then you have an interesting challenge there. So, of course, context is, is very important, but it has to also scale because. Uh, these questions are at, uh, have to be addressed at multiple levels at the same time. They're systemic questions, so they have to be addressed simultaneously at multiple levels and across many dimensions. So holism or integration, which is, I guess, uh, the life practice of Oroville, is really the operational challenge. Because there's another question for you, which says, is it now time to decongest uh, cities? How do we develop more communities? Can the government help with laws and incentives to build more self-sustainable centers? We're a little bit confused in this. I mean, we've just produced a, a significant report for the, for the Finance Commission that deals with this question. But basically, what people don't know is, most people don't know is, India is uh, still a land of villages. So we have six and a half lakh villages in this country and just 8,000 urban centers. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's, that's a balance in some, some ways. But the issue, of course, is that, uh, about you know, 100 urban centers in this country produce 40% of economic output. So there's a huge disparity uh, between the productivity of our villages and the ability to create livelihoods uh, and you know, opportunities and provide all the basic uh, you know, social services, et cetera, uh, between villages and the cities. So it's, it's not neither this nor that. It's a system that we have to transform. And in that sense, because you know, Tamil Nadu is sort of host to part of this process, Tamil Nadu is a very interesting transitional example. It's almost 50% urban. It has a very well-balanced structure like Kerala has. So you have to do all of these things uh, at the same time. You can't trade it off. That's a sort of uh, a training of, 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 of sort of too much of sort of logical Western thinking. We have to bring all of these things uh, together. So decongestion uh, is required in some locations, of course. Uh, but in other places, you need to actually aggregate uh, economic activity. If we do not create employment, in many parts of northern India, then the kind of fate that you see of tens of millions of migrants who walk back home will exist because the places where they they, they, they lived and they've been brought up in uh, are not creating enough productive jobs. So then they will come to metropolises, live in 
uh, terrible living conditions um, and then have to suffer uh, as, we, as we've seen. So, you know, we have to look at this thing systemically. Uh, Tuan, there's a very interesting question for you. It says, what further role can Orville play in supporting and scaling eco-citizenship and planetary transformation? How can Orwellian wisdom and experience become more accessible to all? Is there the possibility to a franchise Orville model? Well, that depends which part of the Orville model you want to franchise. Um, <laughs> In fact, they, even the mother has spoken of more autobills in the future, so it's not that it is only going to happen here. You see, the, if you look at, it, the, at the wider, from a wider perspective, Shio Bidwell's vision of transformation is not restricted, fortunately, to autobill. It's going to happen in any case. The evolution continues, whether there is an autobill or not. The idea of places like autobill is to hasten that transition, consciously. If there would be no Shia Windows Yoga, there would be no Ashram, and there would be no Auroville, and there would be not, you know, lakhs of people all over the world doing it in their own way, the evolution would still be there, and there would still be a transition. But the idea of, of intentional communities, as some people call it, is that you do this consciously and you try to hasten it. So I would say it is not so much a question of a franchisee or whatever you want to call it. It is a question of a contagion, a positive contagion, where you act as an example and people take parts of that example and transform it into their own context and do something with it. And then you get an effect of, you know, worldwide uh, transformation and change. If Auroville is, uh, as envisaged, a laboratory of evolution, then the tests which come out of that lab have to be shared with the rest of the world. And then some of those tests may be interesting for other parts of the world and not all of them. Um, so I would say that, yes, uh, I would not call it a franchisee probably, but the whole idea of Auroville is that it is just one experiment in that much wider context of an evolution, which tries to consciously, intentionally, hasten the process of transition to a different consciousness. By the way, before you ask another question, I want to quickly go back to the previous question where Aro uh, rep responded on congestion. You know, as he rightly says, you have to do many things at the same time. One thing also that you have to do at the same time, if you want to decongest, then you have to connect. In other words, if you want to envisage Chennai as it was before in villages called Mailapur and you know you want to have uh, Tiruvannamur as villages again or as decongested places, you can do that but then you have to connect them very well. And as we know from many parts of the world, if I take you know parts of Western Europe, there are a lot of economic activities happening in villages with population of not even 40, 50,000 people, but it works because they are very well connected to others. So decongestion goes hand in hand with connection. You cannot decongest and then don't connect. So that's just a little uh, addition to what Aro was mentioning about decongestion. There's another question for uh, all the panelists. It says, what is the, what is the advice that the panel can give to young budding environmentalists to carry forward the ideals of sustainability in development. Jayashree, would you like to start? Sure, why not? <laughs> but what I am about to say may not be very popular. Uh, I mean, uh, but let me still go ahead and say it, having agreed to answer the question. I think uh, while I appreciate passion, enthusiasm, the willingness to commit time and effort to restoration, to sustainability, whatever it be. I think what I find largely missing is the rigor of academic background that's so essential for it. Let me give you an example. Uh, I mean, it's something that I've said many times, but it's, not, it's worth repeating. All our water body restorations that you see, in, at least in Chennai and Tamil Nadu, it's driven largely by passion, by volunteers who come and clean and uh, you know, make the place beautiful. See, what happens is because there's a lack of 
the training and the academic background that's required for doing this kind of work, they end up causing a lot of damage. I know it's not intentional. A good example of this is in, under the pretext of cleaning the periphery of the water body. They pull out all the plants which they term as weeds. These are native plants, binders, which are the ones that are essential for stabilizing the structure. They do that. They just create some embankment, some mud flats, and say the wetland is restored. I mean, this kind of a very passion-driven approach is something that I'm not very supportive of because it hits us very badly when there is an event like the 2015 uh, flood or the 2005 flood. You need to have the discipline to learn the subject, to learn the techniques involved in it to be open the young budding environmentalists to take up as a, as a kind of an approach. Okay, anybody else would like to take this? What do you, uh, what advice would you give to young budding environmentalists? So if I may, Vijay, I guess the first thing is that, you know, the environment is not only the natural, especially for India at least, the environment is not only the natural environment, the natural environment is very important. There's also the social social environment or the socioeconomic environment. So those of us who work on the natural environment must not forget that we have to address questions of caste or gender or inequality, um, uh, which are uh, an ethnicity, which are absolutely central to the core questions of India's uh, social environment. Because many of the challenges that we see in the natural environment are expressions of contests that are taking place inside society. Uh, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, even when you've addressed the natural and the uh, sort of social environment, there's something else that actually sits behind all of that. And India is very rich in it, but you have to pause and sort of touch and, and be in touch with that. And that is the sort of inner environment. So in some senses, it's a connection between the three. Uh, that's, that's really important. Uh, most of our academic institutions, especially who work only on the natural environment, do not connect with, uh, with, the, with the social environment or vice versa. And very few of them uh, actually uh, uh, sort of, you know, connect, connect with, the, with the inner environment. And in that sense, Oroville is very important and very special because living and coming as a volunteer or just visiting it puts you in touch with all three of them. And that's what I guess is the beginning of, of that sort of true uh, transformative education, which, which that kind of lasts throughout your life. But if you've touched it once, then you know what you don't have, and hopefully that thirst will uh, sort of lead to more exploration and, and, and more sort of ways forward in different parts of the world. This is one more question for you, which is our human settlements have always excluded the economically deprived. How does that help equity and justice? Uh, by and large, uh, you know, if you look through much of history, that's there, especially what archaeologists and historians tell us, and that may be a construction, uh, uh, you know, at, at least from the, the origin of the largest cities in the world, they've been built on inequality. That's a fundamental framework on which sort of urban civilizations have been built. And that's why what you see today, looking at looking back at 5,000 years of history, of history is uh, a lot of, you know, leftover bones of many civilizations, and that, that, that's, that's where the cities are. I think uh, there, there are opportunities to reimagine that in, in deep ways, uh, but that's, you, you cannot do that without addressing some of the social and economic questions that you have. We've addressed that over the last few hundred years, you know, in different parts of the world. For example, slavery was an in, in sort of an in, inherent uh, basis for the creation of most empires and what their cities were created. Many of the wonders of the ancient world would not have been possible without slavery, whether it was in Egypt or uh, in Rome or in Greece, for that matter, uh, and then you know, gender equality is something else uh, that's sort of embedded in the nature of, of of urbanism. I think we are trying to undo some of that, and I think uh, it's not an easy journey because it means that we have to change as people and as communities. And I see that struggle absolutely uh, in sort of the development of nascent sort of democratic governance frameworks, even in a place that is free by charter and by choice, uh, like Oracle. Okay, I think we'll end this by one final question. Uh, this is to uh, Tuan. Tuan, it's a common friend of us. 
Oroskan Vipari upon Aurovillian. He says, how can Auroville inspire and lead radical changes at individual, societal, and government level needed to make real progress towards sustainability as expected by the youth today? Young people the world over are demanding radical changes, not incremental platitudes and marginal measures. Is Auroville, uh, is India ready, willing to respond to this call from the youth? Is India ready to make the changes needed? I mean, Tuan, you can answer this. I think also Mr. Ravi and others can. It's a very, a very good question. How do we transform our, uh, how do we convince our youth? Yeah, maybe um, instead of saying, is India ready or is Oliver ready? You could also put a question like this, is India, is Oliver preventing radical change? And I think nothing is preventing radical change. In, in fact, the Oliver project is all about radical change that goes much beyond nature and sustainability. It's a radical change at the deepest level. Uh, I also feel that India as a whole is not preventing radical change. If there are people who want to work for radical change, they can do so. Uh, you need a critical mass. You see, for anything to succeed, you need a critical mass of young people to, to start such a radical change and such a movement. Listen, uh, our will is meant for uh, 50,000 people. There are only 3,000, so at least 47,000 of the young people should come here and help Auroville to, to achieve its goals. If that answers the question. Okay. Okay. Yes. The same uh, question now to, uh, to all the panelists. Jay Shri, how, how, how do we convince the youth? In fact, uh, this what is it that we can do to impress the youth? Yeah. I think uh, the youth and the kids are far more aware and uh, far more interested and committed to sustainability than probably we were. If I can also put you into my generation, people like us were. Because they've seen the kind of uh, impact that unsustainable lives and livelihoods have imparted on the society. So inspiration is something that comes from multiple resources, from multiple people. I'm, I'm really not able to say that this is what would work to inspire you. But I'm convinced that the generation, the current generation and the future generation, having witnessed all the nonsense that has happened in their lives and in the lives of their parents and grandparents, would naturally have a far more responsible attitude towards nature, towards sustainability. I'm really not able to answer as to how, how does one get inspired or how do we actually inspire you? Because I've not been able to inspire anybody. Uh, I'm still looking for somebody to inspire me. And so in that sense, I'm, I'm just not able to answer that question. So sorry about that. Sure. Mr. Chukan. Very, very difficult uh, question to field because if we knew the answer, uh, it could be happening. I, I think uh, we are all uh, in the same uh, uh, boat and we are searching for answers on how to inspire, how to create a movement. It's uh, something uh, which uh, leaders will have to uh, emerge and show their way. Great. Mr. Balvaskar, the final word. Could you put your mic on, please? Yeah, please. These questions are slightly rhetoric, I feel, you know, because, I mean, if, if someone is really keen to do something, he will do that, you know. I mean, I, I don't think you, you, you are uh, asking someone to help you uh, do this, you know. Uh, so I, I think uh, asking whether Auroville in, and India are ready, willing to respond to the call of the youth is a rhetoric question. In principle, Auroville is ready, in, in India is ready to respond. But uh, what is it that you want? How, 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 
how, uh, what what exactly do you need? And as Pawn said, if, uh, if more and more young people came to Oroville to live here and uh, help in this uh, uh, transformation, that would help. Excellent. Arumar? So I'll be fairly sharp, specifically in the context of Oroville. And I've said this before. Uh, like Tuan said, you need to get your population up to 5,000, if not 10. That's kind of an immediate question. And if those people are young people, uh, as I expect they will be, that's, that's important. To make that happen, there are at least three things that you need to do. The first thing is you need to solve the housing problem. The second thing is that you need to solve the question of sort of immediate sort of income and cash support, which is a tricky and complex question. Uh, and the third one is, is, is the land question. And finally, I think uh, one has to sort of even, even within Oroville, reorient ourselves to accept that Oroville is a gift that uh, a, a, a range of, of very wise people from a few Tamil villages gave the mother to be able to you know, provide the rest of the world a place for this to happen. So that integration between the, uh, the grandchildren, let's say, of those wise people and the rest of us who come and go from Oroville from various other parts of the country in the world is very important because that gift must be honored and celebrated. And if you get all of this together, then I think you might have, uh, you know, you might have the answers to some of your questions as far as Oroville is concerned. Thank you. I think that's a perfect way to end this uh, uh, webinar. It's been uh, wonderful. Thank you very much to all the speakers. I think we really had a very, very interesting uh, webinar, very inspiring with a lot of information uh, from the experts. Remember that this is only the uh, first in the series. We definitely engage all of you, both the participants as well as the speakers in future webinars also to see how we can uh, you know, uh, actually uh, do what a lot of the questions that they ask, uh, help inspire people, help uh, uh, bring about greater sustainability, create greater awareness. And that's exactly the mission of uh, uh, the, the, what we are starting today. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the participants. Thank you to all, also to all the technical people uh, Inge, Niveta, and others at Orville who have uh, helped us uh, with this. Thank you very much. And goodbye. And have a nice evening. Thank you.